I do have hope that we can take control of our, our destiny and our governments and demand absolute transformative change on every level that protects humanity and all life. Hey, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. We interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, and social artists, people who feel deeply and act with courage in the face of uncertainty. As we work to protect what we love and change what we can and learn as we go, our awakened hearts are absolutely necessary partners for our critical thinking minds. Our guest today is Margaret Klein Salomon, PhD, the executive director of the Climate Emergency Fund, which makes grants to the vanguard of the climate movement. She is a clinical psychologist by training, whose work helps people to face the truth of the climate emergency and transform their despair into effective action. Margaret is also the founding principal of Climate Awakening, a project to unleash the power of climate emotions through scalable small group conversations. She is the author of Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth, a radical self-help guide for the climate emergency. She founded and directed the climate mobilization from 2014 to 2020, advocating an all hands on deck, whole society mobilization to protect humanity and the living world from the climate catastrophe. And here's Margaret. Welcome Margaret to What Could Possibly Go Right. And I am fascinated with the scope of your work. Um, You have, according to my research, led two quite different organizations addressing the climate crisis. One is uh, Climate Awakening um, and unleashing the power of climate emotions through small group conversations. And then the other one is the Climate Emergency Fund uh, that's addressing catastrophic climate impacts through funding like super radical organizations. And so you, you seem to like span the rising up and digging deep. And I think both of them, personally, I think both of them are, are really important um, in, in how we're gonna move forward. And so my, my question to you this, and, I, and I'm gonna like set it up in a couple of ways, is, is what time is it in the unraveling of the community of life, which feeds our bodies and souls and cultures and which we sort of glance at from the corners of our eyes in our busy lives. You, you refer on your website to the movie, Don't Look Up. And since most of us have seen this movie about a climate scientist and his student trying to awaken a distracted public to the threat of a comet hurtling toward earth, I thought I'd use this um, as a sort of a, to frame the question. In terms of this story, where are we? Are we Are warnings still falling on deaf ears? Are we distracted impossibly by social media and pop culture? Is the media, even legacy media, not doing enough? Is our government responding sufficiently or is still looking for a capitalist response to the threat? Are there more people awakening? Or are we sitting at that dining table at the end, racing for extinction? You don't have to use this frame, but it seems a film, this film is a mirror for this. And on this podcast, we support people who want to understand where we are and how to respond. So where do you see space for creative response? Where can we still push and pull and move things? And what does bracing look like among mature people? So with all of that set up, Margaret, Give us some of your your thoughts about in the midst of all that could be going awry, what could possibly go right? Thank you. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And Mm -hmm. also uh, my father is a practicing psychoanalyst. My mom has a master's in psychology. Like this is very much like a like a a lifestyle, a way of life. Looking from inside out 
paying careful attention to internal experience. Um, that's, that's what I mean uh, in terms of a, a way of life and, and a certain way of relating to one's own emotions, being curious, uh, compassionate, non-judgmental, and understanding that expressing them and processing them with others leads to better outcomes all around. Um, so with that kind of basic outlook, inside out, consciousness first kind of thing, what could go right it has to start there, right? Like it, it happens in our minds um, and in our, and in what we say to each, each other, our, our uh, social psychology. And there's really a lot of great news in, in terms of what is possible uh, in terms of psychological consciousness shifting. Um, and particularly the, the kind of key concept that has structured my entire climate career is the idea of emergency mode, mm -hmm. that there is a fundamentally, there's two ways that humans can operate it, normal mode or emergency mode. And if you're depending on which one you're in, your behavior is going to look very different. Um, so, for example, your level of focus, your level of prioritization, devotion of resources. Because, you know, if your house is on fire, for example, you don't do anything else, <laughs> right? You just deal with this. You, you, you get to safety. Your thoughts, focus, um, you, yeah, all available resources are deployed, new, new and novel strategies are considered. And relatedly, when a country enters emergency mode, like the United States did during World War II on the home front mobilization, I mean, it's, it's like night and day looking at that versus looking at what we consider possible now. For example, during World War II, 40% of vegetables were grown at home in victory gardens. Uh, gasoline, meat, tires, and other commodities were rationed and everyone got a fair share. The top marginal tax rate was 94% on the highest earners. The government banned the production of new consumer automobiles, saying that all of that industrial capacity needed to be used for tanks and planes. The, the government made huge investments in uh, converting our economy into a, a war economy that, that you know, was able to break every record and production limit and create breakthroughs in every field <laughs> and, and win the war. This, this mode of operating of emergency mode is incredibly powerful once you get there. Okay. So that, that to me has really always been the, the theory of change or the questions. Okay. So how do we get there? How do we get into, you know, in, for World War II, during World War II, we had, um, or before it, we had years of denial and isolationism where the dominant mood in the country was, it's not our war, stay out of it, just no. And it took Pearl Harbor, surprise attack, to be uh, jolted, the country jolted out of this uh, delusion that the, that the war would, could stay away from us and came to the understanding that we had to fight this war and, and win. Um, and so with that collective shift, uh, isolationism evaporated overnight and Congress declared war unanimously except for one abstaining vote. This was, it was like flipping a switch. And so with the climate emergency, that to me has always been the goal. That's how I've framed my mm -hmm. um, participation is that I want to get the country into emergency mode and, and, and the world. I mean, it would, would be great, but that, that, and 
once that happens, what everyone decides to do and how to, you know, how much solar and wind and which agriculture policies or whatever, like I, I, that's all, that's all very specific and, you know, experts and whatnot can handle all of that. If they're operating in the right frame of mind, because right now they're not, they're still in the delusion of normalcy in which, you know, there's sure there's this data coming in from scientists that sounds pretty alarming, but like, you know, people use all of these psychological defenses, compartmentalization or uh, uh, willful ignorance, like, oh, I don't even want to learn about that. Um, or intellectualization, like, yeah, okay, I know it, but I, I don't feel it. So, mm -hmm. so people use those defenses and stay, we're in this very, very weird time so in terms of our social psychology. Right now, globally, 54% of young people say humanity is doomed, right? That's a pretty striking, <laughs> that's a pretty striking finding. And yet, the world is proceeding basically as normal. And people are living their lives, planning their futures, making their career moves, play, you know, retirement, all of this stuff. And it's based on this delusional presumption of normalcy. But so people are doing that while on one track, while on another track, thinking that humanity is doomed and that civilization might collapse during their lifetime. And so, but they're, but like, but what do I do? So... <laughs> <laughs> so that, let's say, cognitive dissonance between those um, two things, I believe has truly revolutionary potential, right? That, that there's a growing understanding of how horrible this situation is and how much transformative change is needed, but people feel helpless and hopeless about it. So, but... If we get the kind of movement that we need, then they then that can switch. The dynamics switch that that and we saw this. I mean, we saw this with in in uh, 20, 2018, 2019 with uh, Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg. And you know, wh when the movement gets going, it picks up all of this momentum. PS people want to be involved, want to help. They, this is something people care about a great deal. But the movement needs to inspire them. It needs to give them hope, real hope, not, not false hope, like, oh, it's going to be fine, don't worry, but like <laughs> hope like we are going to build power and force our politicians to end the fossil fuel industry. And, and we're going to do that with every nonviolent tactic in the book, and we are not going to play nice and we're not we're not asking um that this is something that we are taking responsibility for and and taking control over yeah i believe in the possibility of a collective awakening mm -hmm. uh on on the climate emergency and which which looks like entering emergency mode and i believe that the movements the grassroots movements, uh, particularly the ones that are willing to take on the, the high stakes tactics, hunger striking, um, arrestable, disruptive actions. I, I mean, um, I think are uh, the best way, the single best way to disrupt denial, to help the the public see um, and not just and, and see intellectually, but also emotionally and, in, and socially, uh, that this is an emergency. Like, so for example, um, NASA climate scientist, Peter Kalmus recently, um, chained himself to a chase bank in Los Angeles 
uh, to raise the alarm about the climate emergency that was part of the scientist rebellion, a thousand scientists taking direct action all over the world. Climate Emergency Fund was the lead funder of that group, which I'm very proud. Um, and those actions by scientists are so powerful because of their communicative uh, potential. I mean, what that that humans communicate risk socially not rationally that is so 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 important to keep in mind and when we're trying to determine whether we're in a dangerous situation and we're not sure we look at what other people are doing so this can create a phenomenon called pluralistic ignorance where everywhere there's a group and everyone's looking at each other and everyone's acting normal so it must be okay right and that phenomenon, everyone, everyone seems to be normal, so there must not be an emergency, and therefore I will act normal. Yeah, it's called pluralistic ignorance. And scientists um, have tried for a lot of decades now to calmly and rationally inform the public of the risk from the climate emergency. And that type of communication has not really worked. Um, nor, if you come from a psychological perspective, should we expect it to? Because again, it's not how humans understand risk and communicate risk. So as a metaphor, if you can imagine uh, uh, you're on the street and someone says to you, oh, there's a fire, that's one thing. But if that person is sprinting down the street with terror in their eyes and they say, fire, that's a totally different type of communication. And the IPCC authors and climate scientists have been giving us the first calm, descriptive uh, answer. And it's time for the second. It's time to show the world how desperate we are those of us who actually understand the emergency that this is that there's no time that there's i mean that there's no hope um without absolute transform transformative change at emergency speed and that's i mean people ask me a lot oh do you have hope or you know should people have hope it's like yes and no I have absolutely no hope for our current system. It and 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 neither should you, <laughs> right? <laughs> like it 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 is in the process of total failure, and and leads only to only to hell. Um, but I do have hope that we can take control of our, our destiny and our governments um, and, and demand absolute transformative change on every level that protects humanity and all life. Um, you know, it's actually funny, in your um, introduction of me, you, I, you, you missed a group that I started that was actually kind of like my main Thing for many years, which was I, I founded a group called the Climate Mobilization that advocates a World War II scale response to the climate emergency. And, um, and there's things that we can do all across the board. I mean, we, we wrote a policy paper or yeah, white paper called the Victory Plan that lays out, it's like a hundred pages. It lays out what kind of policies we would do in every sector if we actually treated climate like the existential emergency that it was. Um, so like, for example, banning the expansion of the fossil fuel industry, right? I mean, it's like a no-brainer, do it today. Um, and then set a timetable to for early shutdown of the fossil fuel capacity we have now because burning it will kill us. And it has to be pair that with a rapid scale up of renewables and nuclear and other non-fossil energy sources, um, clean energy. 
And then you have to transform agriculture to, to regenerative. And so, so there could be carbon sinks. And we, I mean, the other ecological limits, right? Like, uh, here's another, these are just so obvious. I mean, how about banning single use plastic? Why not? Why? I mean, it's right there. <laughs> um, so, so these are the steps that we would take if we were acting rationally, if we would, and, and we wanted to live. Um, and so it's, so it's there, the, the, we, the technology is there, the policies are there approximately. We know just, you know, with it, with massive investment and assertive, uh, policy, including, you know, banning destructive industries and forcing the transformation of certain industrial capacity. I mean, we know we could do it. We get, I mean, some people say, oh, this, the, you know, the warming is already too great. Uh, you know, you're doomed no matter what. I, and the truth is, I don't know. And, and they don't know. And no one knows. Um, so it seems pretty obvious that what we should do is eliminate emissions as quickly as possible draw down excess CO2 um, until we can restore a safe climate. And um, yeah, and, and maybe have short-term cooling, low stakes, reversible kind of uh, solar radiation management or white roofs or whatever. This is, this is risky, uh, challenging stuff, but so that one, that one's, I'm not as sure on the first two are obvious, um, but it's there. We know what to do. Will it work? We don't have a guarantee, but we do know, I know that without pursuing such measures again at emergency speed and with, you know, transformative policies, then we are in fact doomed. Um, but I'm, what I'm describing is the only way. <laughs> um, and so I, so yeah, so I think that, you know, one kind of implication of this that is a little bit challenging, but is trying to get people, including within the climate movement to like give up on and move on from like kind of gradualist um, ideas and plans. Well, like for example, I never want to hear the phrase 2050 ever again. It's totally irrelevant. I, I mean, by, by 2050, it, I mean, we could have global civilizational collapse, like for sure it could already have happened. Like, so the idea of, oh, we're going to set our targets, our decarbonization targets, I mean, but the, but the climate movement has been very focused on that for a long time, but we just, we, we need to, to stop and move on. Um, similar, I feel similarly about carbon pricing, you know, not that like, whatever, if I could snap my fingers and have a carbon price, sure. Um, but it's not going to protect us from the collapse of civilization <laughs> and the living world. And that's a pretty big, like, like I, yeah, I think you can kind of think about political advocacy and like the movement with that as a bright line, right? Like if this vision, if this policy program was fully implemented, would it potentially protect humanity and the living world from catastrophic collapse? And if the answer is no, then like maybe we want to rethink. Um, yeah, so I've been talking about policies for a little bit, um, but let me just switch course and talk about action. Um, because like I said, that we're not going to win. I mean, there's no chance that we will win the kind of policy change that we need unless we enter emergency mode. I, I mean, We've seen that. I mean, we've seen that this administration, to a you know, tragic comic degree, you know, there's just yeah, there's just no chance. So, how do we get there? How do we get the Pearl Harbor moment of for collective awakening to the climate emergency? And you know, I've I've explored different uh, <laughs> different elements of this in my work. The climate emotions conversations that 
uh, I host that people can take, can join for free online um, at climateawakening.org. Those, those conversations are, you know, the theory of change there, which I very much believe is that um, by talking about, by sharing people's emotions about climate change, it can help them very much in their uh, entering emergency mode process it getting, getting kind of unstuck from the cognitive dissonance. Um, so yeah, emotional processing, talking about the climate emergency, that's all important. Getting the climate emergency into the news and media as much as possible is critically important. But again, that probably won't happen until the movement takes power. That's really where it's at. That's the, um, the lever that we need to pull is, uh, to, and, and I mean, COVID, COVID was so tough with this because we were going in a terrific direction um, with the movement and it kind of got uh, our knees taken out. Um, but, but it's coming back and it's coming back in a new, with a new level of urgency and in, in terms of tactics, uh, particularly and strategy, which is, is necessary. Just the, the organization or the campaign just stop oil in the United Kingdom, for example, with just a few hundred activists and just a few hundred thousand dollars of funding, they shut down fossil fuel infrastructure, infrastructure sites in the United Kingdom, more than 10 at, at, at one time. They shut them down day after day to the point that the fossil fuel supply in parts of the United Kingdom was suffering and business was disrupted which was, you know, a significant part of their aim. Um, they want the public to feel it. They need, they need the news to report on it. They need, the, they're shaking us. It's saying, wake up. And it's, it was just the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. I, I mm. mean, See, seeing these activists, young people, most of them storming onto oil tankers and into fossil fuel infrastructure facilities and uh, locking on to soccer goals at, at soccer matches. I mean, these are, it's our best, it's our best chance is that, that to, to, to support and grow these movements that are nonviolent, but are absolutely uh, militant, non peaceful, but militant and, um, and ready to fight there. There we're not, it's just not, um, I mean, even with, with Roe versus Wade, we saw this, I mean, uh, this idea of, oh, don't, don't protest outside the Supreme court justice's house. I mean, like this is, and, and I mean, and the laws in the United States are so repressive towards protest, in a, bu in a bunch of red states, they made it legal to hit protesters with your car. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's, it's really a horrible situation in so many ways. And the, the vilification of protest and environmental protesters is, is a real shame. Um, and at the Climate Emergency Fund, we support the, the high stakes activists who are willing to uh, willing to really put it all out on the line and escalate um, protests and and disruption and yeah we're we're just uh, thrilled to see what what is possible when when the groups follow a core strategy and and take this level of, we just work at this level of strategic discipline and coordination. And um, yeah, we're now, we're now working to help them uh, expand into the next phase. Wow. I have so much, many thoughts here. Um, so I'm just going to give myself permission to go over here. Um, so what I'm thinking about is you know, one of the ways that pressure works 
is the experience that there's no escape hatch. You know, and so what it seems to me right now is that there's a variety of escape hatches. And it's not just the 2050 escape hatch, it's the polarizations escape hatch. You know, polars, you know, you press and maybe people wake up, but maybe they polarize. And it feels like that's deepening. And in the United States, the one of the manifestations of the breakdown is this red state, blue state, you know, it's almost like pulling apart. And and so, you know one of my individual theories of change is how do we get people who are polarized on the same page in response to what's going on? Because the pressure can polarize. And even, you know, protesting, you know, outside the Supreme Court justices, it's, there are people sort of up there who are framing this up so that nobody has to think about it. One of the things I think about, and this is just my thing, I work on relocalization. I work on communities responding together to the threat. So that, you know, I live on an island. There's just two escape hatches, a ferry and a bridge, but we're very fragile. And so for me, agriculture, you know, food and water seem to be places where people can come together. Now, maybe that, in your view, is incrementalism. But for me, I've watched the escape hatches. And one of them, of course, is bunkers. Another one is, you know, another escape hatch is van life. You know, people are figuring out the boats and the bunkers and the places on the planet. You know, there's, a, there's this other thing that happens in emergency which is fleeing. And so I just would love to ha have your thoughts on that about how, like in World War II, as you say, Pearl Harbor somehow got us all on the same page. What yeah. is going to get us on the same page? Yeah, I never thought about van life in that context. <sighs> um. <laughs> Yeah, just to expand a little bit, um, most Americans would tell you still feel still feel way too safe personally, mm -hmm. right? That that climate uh, emergency is happening to other people, um, or and it maybe and maybe it's going to touch me, but whatever. Not not really my not really my problem. And that is starting to change mm -hmm. um, as, you know, as it, as it just is demonstrably false. I mean, as the, you know, wildfires come ever closer to your house or, you know, ruin your crop, the smoke ruins your crops or like people are coming into contact with climate disasters, you know, personally more and more. However, there is not there's not uh, um, enough realistic fear. Um, this is this is another debate in the climate movement all the time is, oh, well, fear, you can't, fear doesn't work, fear doesn't work. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't, or for some people it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but it's a, <laughs> it's a very weird argument um, because th the situation is horrifying. So of course we should be afraid. Like why, why wouldn't, people like to like from a whatever a psychological point of view when which you value like truth and responding without defensiveness to what's actually happening uh <laughs> being afraid seems totally desirable um means your your intellectual affective physical systems all like working right um, mm -hmm. but there's all this fear of fear. Oh, no, no, no. Don't make people afraid. Don't make people afraid. But there are some reasons for that. And one is like you're saying, I mean, that fleeing is a, is a response that some people have, um, to fear sometimes, 
but 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 most of the fleeing or or so much of it is happening internally right in people's minds that's mm. you know fleeing fleeing through netflix or <laughs> alcohol social or, media yeah, right really. right yeah that's and, back to, to what you know that's back to to don't look up you know because we watched in that movie people fleeing into all sorts of things yes yes and the so it's like when we just try to put the climate emergency out of our minds, do other things, you know, have fun, whatever. It is a type of fleeing. And it like, we all, everyone needs a break, right? You don't, and I'm not saying think about climate change every minute of your life, though it's, you know, it's always there. Um, but to, to really try to, live in truth, live like to, to, to really try to face the climate emergency and, and process it emotionally, um, talk about it with others. This is a topic of my book, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. It's a self-help book to try and just talk people through as best as possible, this kind of emotional process that I'm discussing about facing reality, experiencing and voicing your feelings, reconsidering your life story, uh, and then entering emergency mode and, and becoming a climate activist. So this is our only home, as the Pope has said, this is our only home. And there, we're like, <laughs> we're, we can't flee. I mean, right now you, you mentioned the Pope and for me, there is a, you know, some people don't like the word morality, you know, anymore, but there is a, a character, moral, ethical, there is a, there's a dimension of this, which is that if your concept of self is, a, is as a self-interested individual, you act in one way. If your concept of self is as part of the whole, not necessarily in an ecological way, but in a moral way, you know, I, I, in my friend Hazel Henderson, you know, her whole thing is about the golden rule. You know, the golden rule is a moral, religious, spiritual, ethical statement. And it's almost like not succumbing to fleeing in a way it requires some other, you know, sort of metal, you know, like, like, I mean, whatever that is, you know what I mean? It's sort of yeah, rectitude. Yeah. There's a rectitude. There is a maturity. There is like, you know, not some sort of like, you know, showy, it's up to me and it's up to all of us, but it is that feeling inside yourself. And religion is not doing that for us. It's supporting the fleeing mentality. I just am thinking about that as I listen to you, that there is another dimension to call on, which is in a way, right and wrong. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I, I, you know, and we probably need to like wind, wind toward the end. I'm fascinated, but you know, I would love to have you reflect on that. Yeah, I think that there is a combination of morality with something new or at that I think of as like enlightened self-interest, um, mm -hmm. meaning just an understanding that like for me personally, just my own life or, or like my family's life, whatever, like realizing that we can't succeed without a climate mobilization. It's not, it's actually not possible to have like individual level success in like this lifetime. Like, sorry, uh, everything's coming crashing down. Like it's, I mean, maybe you can you get it for like a brief fleeting moment or something, but um, you know, if you want to be safe and secure and prosperous, 
uh, then we need to do this emergency climate mobilization. So, so I mean, I don't know, maybe that's itself a kind of morality, but, but my point is my, like for climate work, speaking personally, but I know this is true for so many others, is that the combination of my desire to protect, you know, my, my own life and the, those of people I love and the lives of people I've never met, um, you know, people in the global South, uh, people, people who are already suffering now, like the desire to help animals and species that, and ecosystems that I've never seen and don't, or don't know anything about whatever. These are all of these forces come together to like, to create what's been for me by far the most powerful force I've ever experienced in my life. I mean, that's really just propelled me for the past eight years into some kind of <laughs> crazy like flow state of action and engagement. And it's, you know, I, I it's amazing. I'm, I'm like, wow, this is well, what a, what a journey, but it's, but it's because of just channeling that and, and, and something else as well. I mean, I call it, I talk about this in my book, but I talk about like the life force or like, yeah, the force on earth that wants to live. Maybe it's God or, um, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, didn't grow up religious, but, um, but this work has brought me a long way towards that because, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, it, it seems it's, yeah, it seems clear to me that, um, these are not, these are not like morally neutral or like whatever the world isn't neutral on the topic. Um, but actually has some very strong that's, feelings. Yeah, I, I just almost that story of I'm going to use like a sort of like an old timey word, but sort of the ennobilization of your life. It's like Einstein, you know, it's like the maturation is expanding your circles of compassion. It's like, you know, you, you started out and mm. talking about it, it was self-interest. My self-interest is in the, you know, my ability to prosper. But then I identify with people I don't know. You know, I identify with people in the global South. I have a moral imagination about people I don't know who are suffering from the consequences of the climate. And then going from that to, you know, the community of life, the species, and going from that is like, what is life itself, but other, but other than the will to live and going from that to the G word, you know, it's like (laughs) this expansion of soul, if you will, I think can be part of flipping the switch because we I think we all know deep down it's like people put it psychologically as oh we're not I'm not doing enough as if doing enough were a thing you know but we know deep down that we're engaged in something that is toxic to our souls and we cannot our souls can't find our way out and, and, you know, there's some individuals who self-immolate, you know, there's like people who go on hunger strikes. This is soul work as well as psychological work, as well as political work. And, and I'm just listening to you. It's not like I have some theory that I came in with, but listening to you, that's the dimension. I, I feel flitting around the edges of what you're saying. And, and I just am so moved by your work, the content of it, but the dedication of it and the ferocity which with, with which you approach this and the intelligence is really impressive. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This was a strange word in the context, but this was fun. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that would be my middle name. <laughs> uh, what is it? Emma Gold, Goldman said, you know, I'm not going to join any movement that I can't dance to or whatever it is she said, you know, it's like fun is also a piece of this, the enjoyment of the camaraderie. Yeah. 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 To be, yeah. In all, in all seriousness, 
Yeah, when when I talk to people about their climate emotions, the number one thing that comes up is still alienation. No one understands. I'm all alone with this, whatever. So, I mean, yeah, truly, there is a joy in talking to people who are living on the same planet as me, you know, one in which there's a climate emergency. Um, So, exactly. Okay. well, thank you so much for taking the time and blessings on all your work. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.